Hello, and a warm welcome to all of you. I am Juhi Gurvara. Uh, I head corporate marketing for the Philips Indian subcontinent, and I'm also the chair for the Marketing Society India Hub. And uh, today I'm delighted to be hosting this session where we're going to be leveraging insights from LinkedIn's latest survey of technology decision makers, the age of agility. Now, 2020 has uh, accelerated the evolution of technology completely. Today, technology plays an important role in empowering companies, employees, and customers to achieve more together. So the format for today is uh, fairly simple. What I will do is I'm going to introduce Anita Rao Kapoor, Head of Insights APAC for LinkedIn shortly, and she will share the background and some key findings from the Age of Agility report. And then we will bring on a panel discussion around some of the key findings. But uh, before I get started, a few key things. We do encourage interactivity, so please feel free to use the chat function throughout this discussion. And if you have specific questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A facility. Keep them short and let us know who they are for, and we will pick those uh, during the conversation. So now uh, with that, it is my great pleasure to welcome Anita to share the key findings from the report. Anita, over to you. Thanks so much, Juhi. Uh, obviously delighted to be here, uh, like many of us today, dialing in from my bedroom in, in Singapore for this virtual event, uh, but excited to share more about the age of agility and how things have changed over the past one year, specifically when it comes to uh, implications for technology uh, buying in the B2B sector. And just, just give me a second while I go ahead and figure tech out and start to share my screen. Um, is my screen showing up okay? Absolutely perfect. Go on, Anita. Uh, all right then, so in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to do a very quick whistle-stop tour uh, around B2B uh, technology buying and how it's evolved over the past one year. Uh, all of the good stuff that you see today and here today will be based off uh, the biggest piece of B2B technology research um, that, that LinkedIn does every single year. Obviously, for many reasons, uh, the last year is particularly exciting. Uh, but before I dive straight into it, uh, let me recap and share something that Satya Nadella shared at the last Microsoft earnings call. It's something that resonated very strongly with me. He talked about this idea of the past year being the dawn of a second wave of digital transformation. And increasingly, we're beginning to hear, beginning to understand, beginning to come to grips with the fact that we're not going to go back uh, to a new normal. Uh, COVID in many ways has been a catalyst for how the world is going to change and those changes are going to sustain over the, over the foreseeable future. Um, and once he says it, of course, it feels, seems pretty obvious that uh, while last year brought some pretty massive sweeping paradigm shifts, it also brought you know, some pretty phenomenal um, accelerated innovation and an opportunity for us to reimagine our lives and our businesses and actually create a future that we want to live in. Uh, and if we look at businesses who have thrived despite everything in the last year, we see that it's those who've understood and shifted away from their current beliefs and stepped into new ways of reaching, understanding and engaging with their audiences have thrived. And increasingly, we see that for this new age of agility that we're standing at the threshold of, it will be this ability to test and learn from new business models that's going to bring um, you know, technology uh, brand success. Uh, why the focus on technology? So technology as a sector has probably seen some of the most sweeping changes and it's fair to say it's probably transformed forever as well. Uh, so in July uh, 2020, we at LinkedIn Marketing Solutions uh, surveyed nearly 6,000 
uh, decision makers globally from over 20 countries to try and understand specifically what some of those shifts were and to distill them down to five key trends that are here to stay. Uh, APAC as a region was really strongly represented. So we had close to 2000 uh, respondents from our region alone, which means that APAC is a third of this study. Uh, from an audience perspective, we spoke not just to IT decision makers, but to business and cross-functional leaders who have researched, evaluated, bought, implemented, or renewed uh, business technology solutions in the past six months. So I'm pretty sure everyone's at the edge of their seats. With that, let's take a quick look at the five key shifts that promise to change how we do business in the world of B2B technology. Uh, I'll run through the um, five key trends quite quickly and then come back to key takeaways for us as technology brands operating in this new normal. Um, so, so trend one is something that we had actually seen uh, emerging in previous years, uh, but it's a trend that has only intensified this year. And that's the power is now held by members of the committee beyond the IT decision maker. Um, it's interesting that today nearly every function in an organization holds sway or influences the future of a business's tech stack. Uh, just to look at how the numbers stack up, we see that revenue generating functions are holding more and more seats at the buying table, an incredible 70%, as you will see from uh, the numbers on this slide, said that non-IT teams, uh, whether it's business development, finance, sales, engineering, as well as marketing, hold the most influence on tech purchases. Um, what's also interesting is the impact it has had on the core uh, IT function. So IT is clearly still a hub in the decision-making uh, process. It's still the largest function driving those decisions. But it's interesting to see that their overall level of influence has declined uh, significantly. Uh, just to give you some reference, uh, when we first did this study in uh, 2014, the numbers for IT as a decision maker were up to 40% higher. So we're seeing a decline of about 40% for um, IT as a function when it comes to tech buying. The second trend, as you can imagine, given that the buying committee itself has expanded exponentially, the second trend is then anchored around what we see is an increasingly complex customer journey. So as we all start to reframe, re-understand and reimagine what is possible with technology, uh, we know that there is even greater competition for buyer attention and limited opportunities uh, to win share of uh, mind. Um, as a start, we know that the average tech buying journey in APAC is about 15 months. But the data also tells us that the way um, the journey is broken up isn't completely equal. The early stages are, in fact, a lot more crucial with very strong involvement, as well as a large proportion of time being spent uh, evaluating options. So it's the start of the buying journey that we see is increasingly a crucial milestone for all brands to pay attention to. Uh, in fact, uh, about two thirds of the buying committee said that they researched brands they want to invest in well before even reaching out to a vendor. So what that means is that, you know, a big part of the conversation is sealed before the brand even walks in through the door. Uh, it also means that, of course, brands that are salient and famous in the tech market space will have an outsized advantage. And brands that are engaging more sporadically or only engaging at the buying stage will obviously be at a disadvantage given how you know, the customer journey itself has fundamentally shifted. Uh, so if you look at increasingly complex buying landscape, increasingly complex buying journey, that kind of brings us quite nicely to this trend around the paradox of needs that we're seeing uh, when it comes to tech buying. Um, you have this decentralized buying committee, you have a long and complex buying journey, and that's kind of translated to an increasing number of requirements that are now at the table. Um, needs that are sometimes uh, conflicting with each other. 
as you will see from the from the numbers on this slide um, tech buyers want innovation they want flexibility and they want the value that challenger brands typically bring but they're not willing to compromise on re reassurance reliability that comes from typically working with larger brands so in in essence basically uh, they want and need uh, everything uh, in fact this trend is particularly strong in in apac um, and Frankly, uh, before we saw the full results, I personally thought that APAC would probably be a lot more price sensitive. But in fact, when compared to their counterparts in Europe and North America, APAC tech buyers are placing a very strong emphasis, a greater emphasis, in fact, on brands that are consistently understanding their needs and offering flexibility. Um, down to our fourth trend, which is really around how all of these shifts are also redefining how we communicate, how we exchange information with each other. Uh, so buyers are more open to challengers. They are actively invested in sourcing for brands that they want to work with. And in that environment, social proof and validation starts to become a very, very critical part of the buying journey. So your offer might be best in class but your buyers won't take your word for it. Um, so we see that tech buyers in APAC still find advertising quite relevant, and it actually remains a very important source of awareness, along with professional peer reviews and actual experience with the vendor. Um, and, and peer experience here, peer, peer endorsement here is a pretty interesting point. Uh, we see that nearly one in two APAC buyers say that peer validation is a primary vehicle for increasing trust in a product. Um, and it's interesting to see that pattern being mirrored on our platform as well. Um, LinkedIn has about 13.5 million tech buyers from APAC active on the platform. And we've seen some pretty impressive growth in engagement over the past, uh, past 12 months. In fact, we just released figures earlier this week where we saw that conversations on the platform were up 48% year on year. So we're still talking, we're still, still talking to our friends, still trying to figure out who has the best deal in the market, just that the way in which we do it has increasingly pivoted into social platforms and digital channels. Uh, that brings us to our fifth and final trend. Um, so with budgets being scrutinized more than ever before, uh, buyers we see are invested in the shared outcome, not just a product. So this shift means that there is a need for ongoing dialogue, ongoing support, and a relationship that continues even after the sale is closed. See that trust, support, reassurance, these are all increasingly important when it comes to technology brand investments. And the post-sales frontier is probably the last post of differentiation for many brands. So about 60% of tech buyers are saying that the post-sales support is a major factor when it comes to selecting a vendor. As a brand, then what it means is that while you continue to build and implement your marketing strategy in engaging your buyers, you have to continue the conversation during and after the sale process as well. Just to look at all five uh, trends on a page and um, identify what some of the patterns here are, uh, which I'm and and I'm, I'm pretty sure many of you would have spotted that there's a pretty consistent thread in in terms of the evolution of B2B tech buying. So as a start, we've seen that tech buyers are increasingly diverse. They're contributing, shaping new technology investments. It's a bigger um, pool of people at the table, you're not just talking to the lonely IT guy in a gray suit on the other side of the table. Um, and on the flip side, we see that while there are more people at the table, the role of IT as well has also changed. Um, they are now not just a gatekeeper, they are this guide within the organization who are navigated, uh, who are na responsible for navigating the entire um buying committee within an organization towards the right decision. So increasingly, it's critical that we empower 
this next generation of IT guides. Uh, the second trend, as we saw, was really around uh, you know, information overload, particularly in a virtual world, and therefore this big challenge increased. It, it, it was always a big, it was always a big challenge. It's probably just bigger than it ever was before, which is getting the cons con consumer attention. How famous your brand is, how familiar your buying audience is with your proposition could make or break your win rates. Uh, brands actually risk not reaching their full potential if they don't invest enough in a compelling brand story or they miss out with, uh, you know, copy or creative that doesn't leave a lasting impression. Uh, because as we, as we saw, that initial uh, start of the journey, even before, you know, we're engaging in a conversation is increasingly important today. And that comes with the fact that technology buyers, it's not just hard to get their attention, they're actually spoiled for choice today. And they're weighing their options even more carefully than before um, and, and then voting with their wallets. It's not just innovation versus stability or value versus support. They want everything and they want a brand who will prove to be supportive, resilient, and a partner really, you know, versus a, you know, versus just another vendor in the vendor pipeline, someone who will consistently meet their many and evolving needs. And then there is social strategy and something that brands increasingly need to pay attention to, um, which is giving end users something exciting to talk about, something exciting to think about. And that today is critical in building trust and creating that ongoing dialogue on how your brand is uniquely positioned to solve your audience's challenges becomes increasingly important. And then lastly, don't forget your customer halfway through the buying journey. Budgets are even more than before under scrutiny and post-sales support and a vendor that has kind of basically stood the test of partnership as we saw with, you know, trend number three is going to, uh, you know, have this outsized advantage of winning, um, winning ongoing deals as well. Uh, and what that means for you as a brand is that you have to align marketing and sales. You have to stay close to the customer before, during, and after the sale with a consistent experience across all your touch points. Uh, that was it, a whistle stop, 30,000 feet view of the biggest shifts that are impacting uh, B2B tech buying today. Um, I'm really excited to move over to our friends from Philips, PayPal, Oracle, and SES to hear more on their perspective and how some of these trends are playing out in their world. Juhi, over to you for a quick tee up. Thank you so much, Anita. That was very insightful. And uh, while you shared those uh, crisp trends, now I think it's time for us to dwell a little deeper. Before that, I'd like to call upon our panel. And uh, as I call them up, I'd like them to introduce themselves so you hear it straight uh, from them. So can I first call upon Rob? Hey guys, uh, good afternoon, Rob Simons. Uh, I head up international SMB and partner marketing at PayPal. And uh, as you can see from my background, I am based in Singapore. Thank you, Rob. And uh, now can we call upon Rama? Thanks, Judy. Hi. Uh, my name is Rama, Ramanathan. I'm based out of Bangalore. I work for Oracle NetSuite as a director of marketing. Thank you. Glad Thanks, to Rama. And now I'd like to call upon Sam. Hi, everyone. This is Sam Chu. I'm based in Hong Kong um, and I work for SAS. So that's uh, pronounced, uh, you know, it's spelled S A S, but pronounced SAS. Um, and we're actually the number one advanced analytics and AI platform, according to Forrester, Gartner, and IDC. So don't confuse us for the airline or the you know, special forces or the software company. Thank you, Sam, Rama, and Rob. Now, what I'm going to do is I'll step aside a bit and let the panel continue with Anita. So you have an insightful, power-packed 40 minutes of discussion to dwell deeper into the trends. And then I will be back for the next piece. Over to you, Anita. 
Thanks again, Juhi. Uh, so I'm going to start this off, uh, potentially targeting my first question to Sam. Um, so again, we've, we've, you know, we've all just heard and seen from uh, the age of agility and the results uh, that we talked about that COVID has had a huge impact when it comes to uh, technology budgets, when it comes to technology spends. Keen to hear from you and the impact that has had at you know, SaaS or, uh, you know, absolutely tap into your wider perspective as well. How do you think that has shaped uh, short-term and long-term business priorities? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want, I want to start out with the fact that COVID hasn't had an impact on humanity, right? We're all humans, regardless of whether we're business people or civilians or et cetera. I think it's a rare event that has truly impacted all of us globally, not all equally, but globally we're impacted by it. And I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that we're coming together to work as a team internationally and you know, have a lot more cooperation. So when we think about the factors that impacted us, uh, I, I look at it from maybe from a business perspective, from four points of view or four pieces of foundation. First of all, it's the people and the culture, be it ourselves, our employees or our customers. Um, so you know, first of all, health is the most important thing. Uh, we can't have a business without protecting our employee health, both short-term and long-term. So, you, so you're gonna see you know, short-term changes in terms of behavior and benefits for the employees, as well as how we service our customers. You know, we used to service our customers in person, and now you know, we're, we have to social distance uh, until you know, that vaccination is out until we have herd immunity. So that's the impact on people and culture. Uh, the second impact would be on the, uh, I would say the technology. So I think it, you, you have that slide where uh, Satya Nadella just said, you know, this is the second wave of digital transformation. I think I heard somewhere that he mentioned, you know, we're seeing digital transformation, 10 years worth of digital transformation happen uh, within less than a year. So uh, for people in the technology field, this is a very good thing, uh, right? I mean, you know, we used to have to tell people, oh, you know, one day things are all gonna be digitalized. You don't need to have that in-person meeting. And then now the reality is, yeah, we're, it's already too late. You know, most of us were not prepared for this kind of pandemic and, you know, the investments actually lags the reality of it. So that's uh, the second impact. Uh, the third impact would be on, I would say, the data and insights. You know, now that everything is digital, uh, you know, there's so much data that needs to be analyzed. There needs to be a lot of testing and, and insights that need to be derived. And, and that's the impact that we see on the IT where, uh, you know, traditionally IT people were seen as the analytics expert. But now that function has shifted onto the other areas within the business, so marketer, salespeople, we're all becoming analytical. So there's going to be a lot more analytics being done by uh, you know, people outside of those functions. And, and on a personal note, um, you know, I, I think I'm uh, very lucky to, uh, to, to you know, not, not have been impacted as much uh, by COVID compared to, you know, some of my friends and families, uh, you know, who have lost family members. So I think, yeah, I'm really impressed with one of the things that I think LinkedIn did where, you know, you had your employees reached out to those in need to say, hey, we're here. Uh, if you wanted someone to talk to, or, you know, reach out to me. Um, yeah, uh, if there's anything I can do to help, you know, I'll, I'll be willing to do that. Thanks very much, Sam. I mean, loved, uh, you know, loved this whole idea of uh, COVID and the pandemic being a catalyst for change. Uh, you know, when it comes to humanity, when it comes to business, when it comes to how we live and how we work and in, in just so many other ways, I think it's just been that catalyst for change. I love that perspective. Thank you. Um, just looking around this virtual table to see who, who might want to build on that, uh, Rob. Uh, I might pass the armor on this one, actually. I'll do, I'll do Rob. It's fine. Thanks. Uh, Rama, actually, do you want, is there, we'd love to hear your perspective. Is there anything that you might want to add on to, to what Sam just said, or it's, you know, uh, pretty much aligned with 
uh, what we are seeing um, from coming through from his perspective. Uh, pretty much aligned, except that um, we've seen uh, we have seen involvement at all levels, and then one of the I think it follows up uh, with the other perspective is that empowering ID cards, where, which is where I would like to throw light on because now uh, we are seeing all functions of the business actually uh, being completely digital, uh, being remote. Uh, even the applications needs to be uh, supportive of their digital dreams, the digital transformation or transformation, what we may call. So that's the biggest shift that has happened and it is irrevocable. So that is something that we need to be cognizant of, whether it's search, product, service, all the factors have become completely digital. The whole journey, the application, even the deployments. So I'm sure you're not covering one of the factors that you mentioned, the post-sale part, right? Even the applications get digitally, completely remotely deployed. So that's a big shift that has happened. The reason why I'm giving this perspective is that, see, I come from ERP, cloud ERP. Uh, traditionally, ERP has been on-site, right? It's been on-site, but the last 20 years it's changed, the narrative has changed. What has happened even for this industry is that uh, customers are now open saying that, or the mindset or paradigm shift has happened is that even if it's fine deployed completely remotely. So people are okay. And very interestingly, because it's getting deployed even remotely, uh, people across various time zones are involved in it. And you go live much faster, much earlier, right? Your go-to-market has come down. The time to go to market has come down. Those things have happened which we would have not otherwise perceived or even felt actually. Thanks. No, that's fabulous, Rama. I, uh, in fact, I think I was just reading a piece by McKinsey um, where they interviewed a whole bunch of marketers and CMOs. And to your point, the outsized uh, feedback and very clear feedback is that a huge majority actually prefer the, you know, a digital environment, the acceleration that it has brought to business processes. Um, would love to hear from uh, Sam and Rob as, as well. How has the role of IT changed within your organizations? Or perhaps the role of IT hasn't changed as much as it has um, for Rama. Have other functions uh, changed? And Sam, I know you said, you know, uh, you shared some color around data and insights and how everyone needs to be insights enabled. Uh, but just keen to hear, are there any other big shifts that you're seeing from IT as well as non-IT functions? I think, uh, well, you know, following on the, on the trend that you established, uh, the fact is, you know, IT is, even, even if we're buying technology, IT is now a smaller factor in the decision-making process because uh, people are becoming more tech savvy. So, uh, you know, before SaaS, I used to work for a luxury retail company. Uh, DFS group. And because I was more technically inclined, I was always mistaken for being part of the IT team, even though I was on the marketing team. So, so that's one of the shifts. You're going to see more and more marketers and salespeople and, you know, even the C-level executives who grow up digitally. Uh, you know, I, I think I, I would like to think I'm fairly old, you know, but comparing to the millennials, I mean, I think uh, we were saying that millennials were the first generation that grew up natively on digital uh, and that is a fact so so that's going to happen where a lot of these decision making are going to be made by people who are fluent in technology who may have even done coding as a hobby or in their spare time because you know kids nowadays uh, there's some pressure to learn coding from very young so so you're going to see these people you know grow up to become you know decision makers and who may not be part of IT at all yeah, so that's going to uh, definitely impact society as a whole. Love that. Coding as a life skill. Rob? Yeah, just to, I guess just to bounce off what Sam was saying. I, I, when I was reading the report, uh, to be honest, I, I was surprised it was only 63%. Uh, I think we're in a, you know, we talk a lot about digital transformation, but uh, I think the reality is we're in a, in a truly digital era um, and the the, the um, you know, purchasing decisions is, is um, completely decentralized for me. Um, for me, ultimately, it comes back to what are we solving for? Um, what are the needs of the customer? Uh, and that's where, you know, that's the starting point. Um, you, know, the, you know, a number of examples where that, you know, that, that insight or that starting point from, can come from anywhere in the business. I may just add to you, actually. Uh, I think uh, in line with what you're finding is primarily, I think it's no longer the gatekeeper. IT is no longer the gatekeeper because the persona has changed. The decision makers are actually 
not in the IT because what we find, I'm coming from the context that I am working because IT you find is primarily a facilitator, a catalyst to the whole process. But actual decision-making, it all happens at a CEO level or a founder's level or, or a finance level because the product that I deal with is, uh, is ERP. The core is financials of that, right? So the products factors, service factors, the price factors make everyone involved. It is not possible for someone to be a gatekeeper in this process. So at the best, they have to change their mindset to be a catalyst. So it's never the case that uh, so as rightly said by Rob, it's not 60%, it's close to, it's, everyone has a hand on it. And the dominant hand is of the CEO and the CFO. Which makes it tough, right? I mean, whether we are, you know, buying, uh, you, whether we're on the seller side or the buyer side, or even if we want to kind of influence internal stakeholders, and I'm pretty sure this is true for all of us in in our day jobs and what we do as well, that increasingly, for us to push an idea through, there is a fairly layered multiple set of uh, complex stakeholder maps that each of us navigate. Um, so in that kind of situation, how, how should technology brands be thinking about positioning their brand or positioning a service around something that's not an immediate requirement? Do you want me to take this one? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it, Rob. Sure, sure. Um, if it's all right with you, I'll, I'll share a little story, uh, something that's quite relevant for us at, at PayPal. Um, you know, I think it goes without saying that implementing any, you know, new tech of any kind is often um, challenging, uh, quite resource intensive and very costly. Um, and there's a lot of perception around that. So, you know, often there's a natural resistance uh, against this kind of change without a very strong business case um, or a very strong um, endorsement from, from leadership. Uh, we, we often talk about uh, the concept of marginal gains, uh, and there's an inter interesting story behind it, which I'll explain. Um, anyone, anyone who's a big fan of cycling uh, will know uh, of a gentleman by the name of Sir David Brailsford. Um, he's currently the general manager at Team Sky, but I think uh, what he's arguably more um, famous for is developing this concept of marginal gains. Uh, and and let, me, let me give you some context. So uh, prior to the uh, 2008 Olympic Games, uh, Great Britain had won one gold medal in the previous 100 years. Uh, I'm someone who likes data, and I don't think that's a very good uh, ratio there. Um, but fast forward to kind of what he started to do was applying uh, this really this concept of marginal gains, uh, which was really about looking for the small increments uh, at every stage of the journey. Uh, I'll give you some examples. So uh, he set out by designing the bike seats to make them more comfortable. Uh, they started to rub alcohol on the tires to, so that so the tires could get a better grip. Um, they tested different types of massage gels to see which, which ones uh, the, you know, the riders responded to the best. And they even went as far as determining for each rider what was the best pillow, what was the best mattress uh, that led to the best night's sleep for each rider. Um, you're probably wondering where I'm going with this and why I'm talking about cycling in a, in a, um, in a marketing forum. But the aggregation of, of these marginal gains, uh, fast forward to Beijing Olympics 2008, uh, they went and won seven gold medals. Um, if you think that was a fluke, fast forward to 2012 in London, uh, they won another seven gold medals. And I think it's really the aggregation of these marginal gains uh, and, and the approach that we can, you know, tie back to today's world to show, you know, this is how you start to show some traction um, with the tools and processes that you have today um, to build that influence and drive change. Um, I'll give you a quick example of uh, some time in, in, in one of my former roles uh, of applying marginal gains. Uh, so uh, I uh, joined a fast growing scale up in the health and beauty sector. And one of my first uh, problems to solve was, was our um, very primitive um, email tool. Uh, for those of you in, uh, digital mar in, in email marketing, uh, the tool we had was so primitive, it would have made MailChimp look like the Nirvana. Uh, and basically we, we basically had to set out to prove through marginal gains why we needed to go external and, and, bring, in, um, and bring in tech. So, you know, we started off with some really simple things. We were testing ways to improve open rates through subject lines and content, uh, looking at different combinations of imagery and copy and all the, you know, all the usual good stuff that comes with email marketing. Um, we then applied intent-based data to start to understand what was resonating best with customers. And if you think about what I described with marginal gains, uh, it was that process that we went through that then gave us, you know, the, the, um, the power to convince uh, leadership at the time that this investment uh, you know, considering a lean budget was the right thing to do. Um, and ultimately it set us up for this next 
growth. Uh, and, you know, so, so we, we talk a lot about uh, agile uh, as a word that does get thrown around a lot. But my advice, you know, the way that I, I would say is, you know, focus on the 1% gains uh, and less about the moonshots. Love that. Uh, love that story, Rob. I'm pretty sure we're all going to be Googling on marginal gains right after we, yes. we, we wrap up today. Um, but yeah. I think what stood out for me was at that heart of that story, there's a story around, uh, you know, intimacy and making sure that you understand every single friction point on that journey well enough and start to eliminate them one by one. By one. So you love, love that analogy, love that story. Uh, really, really cool stuff. Sam, let's see, uh, uh, is there anything you would like to add on to that? Um. Perhaps I've bring heard that theory to the table. Sure. Um, uh, well, I, let, let me just start a debate here. I, you know, I agree with what Rob mentioned uh, in terms of margin, marginal gains. Uh, for sure, optimization is important, but just as important would be the strategy. Okay? Uh, stra strategy, because uh, the way I see it, um, you know, what what Rob mentioned was more about tactics. You know how to tweak this, how to tweak that, um, but sometimes the strategy is just as important, if not more important. Because you know, I, I think you might heard of the reference where you know, uh, let's say um, Airbnb is a good example. You know, can you build a uh, hotel company without owning any hotels? Uh, that's a shift in its strategy where you know they're using data and digital transformation to completely change the landscape and the industry uh, so so that's a that's a very clear uh, you know example of what's happening right or Alibaba is another great example here in APAC you know can you build a, a company that sells goods without owning any factories right all, all Alibaba at least when it started I was just connecting you know, buyers to sellers on a platform that they built. So, so I, I think it is both. It's not, you know, life, there's many ways to succeed in life and there are many uh, ways to do it. But, I, I need, you know, some companies are great at strategy. Some, some are great at marginal gains and others who do fairly well are, are pretty good at both. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, actually, this is uh, since the question was centered around a new technology and how do you convince people who don't have an immediate requirement, I think I would go back to a old classic framework, which is called uh, Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm framework. There are, I'm not the first guy to go to an Apple store because I'm a laggard because I wait for 100 people to buy before I decide to buy because I want to see the reviews, right? There are but there are early adopters. For any technology, whether the requirement is not there, they want to tinker. So we need to, when you build a persona, when you want a new product, you don't need to go and search for needs. You go and create the market. So like Ford used to say that if I had asked people what they want, they would have just said horses. No one would have said cars. So to answer that question, it's a Ford's answer. You find out few people, whether they have needs or not, they will love to tinker with it. So they have, those are the early adopters we need to look for. If these early adopters, uh, what do you call, the, do the bandwagon, I would call the bandwagon effect, then they would restore the mainstream would adopt. They would, they would build the requirements. You don't need to go and create it. That's you know, a that's really a, good thing. Oh, yeah, that, that's a really good example, Ram. Um, you know, uh, I, I love the, 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 you know, the iPhone example. So, so full disclosure, I used to work for Microsoft. And uh, when, you know, back when I was working for Microsoft, they, that's when they launched the first iPhone. So, you know, the way I see Apple is actually to Rob's point, they, the way I see Apple as a Microsoft employee is they were not a, you know, a game changer in terms of the way they, they strategically, you know, uh, rebuilt the phone. That technology was there, uh, you know, there was Palm Pilot, there were other phones that did similar things. But the way I see Apple, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a business person is they were really good at doing that marginal gain where they improve all these little things that used to take 10 steps and they made it into a few simple steps. They were not the first. They were not the first. Let me repeat that. In, in terms of building a phone that was, you know, using touchscreen in terms of envisioning this future, 
In fact, it was Bill Gates who, you know, maybe 20 years earlier said, you know, there will be a world in the future where everything is mo mobile enabled. And the way I see Steve Jobs was he's a visionary and taking that concept, uh, but really executing really well on it. Yeah, so, so you know, uh, the civilian perception out there will be, you know, Steve Jobs is this amazing visionary. The way I see it, he was, he was this amazing, uh, you know, business technical guru who just tweaked the hell out of a concept that others came up with. Yeah. Love that, Sam. And I think with that, we've probably covered the full spectrum of where a brand might sit. If you have something that's groundbreaking and can completely change uh, an existing business model, by all means do that. And that will get to your early adopters. But for many of us who are in the market today and don't have that advantage, start to think of you know marginal gains, start, start to think of optimizations that really matter to your customer. And, you know, that's a great way for, uh, you know, starting to build market share. Love that. Love that. Thanks, guys. Um, with that, um, I wondered if we might want to kind of pivot into this whole notion of, you know, buyer attention. Um, and, you know, we, we looked at some of the results. It's increasingly hard. There's just so much of information. It's like drinking from a fire hose uh, for, for all of us. Uh, let alone technology buyers. So what are you doing in your businesses to kind of ensure that you stay relevant, ensure that you stay salient? Has there anything that you've shifted in the way your marketing teams operate, particularly when it comes to audience engagement and audience um, understanding? Yeah, go ahead. Sure, thanks. Go for it. Yeah, uh, see, I was just uh, with one of the leaders that when I'm working with, uh, she actually made a very powerful point. When you go for a hunt, I'm a vegetarian and a vegan, but I'll still make this point. When you go for a hunt, right, make sure that you have breakfast and lunch. That hunt is for the dinner. So the brand awareness is a dinner, right? Uh, so many people give up early in the search for breakfast and lunch. So this conflict was there when last year pandemic. I'm sure the marketers have this paradox. Right. One, you have to cater to the pipeline needs. The pressure is always there. So this pipeline and leads is always an issue or a day-to-day -day issue. Right. But at the same time, how do you balance this brand awareness? Right. Because that's what is going to bring the salience to the system. Right. Um, so what is that? How do you balance this question? What's the proportion I need to spend in my marketing budget? If you read LinkedIn's own report from Les Bennett, what they say is the proportion should be 60-40. 60% going towards demand generation and 40% going towards brand awareness that we try to consistently maintain, irrespective of the pressure on the leads, right? We said, no, right? We are not going to miss the dinner while we work on the breakfast and the lunch. So that's a crucial part of the equation. We should not miss this equation. So one, if I have to put that equation, it's a compelling message that stays, that's part of the stickiness, plus the media. That means where are you promoting? So anyone who's searching should be able to see you. It could be search tactically, for example, or it could be comparison platforms, or it could be your organic SEO strategies, whatever you do. So first is the messaging, second is the message, second is the media. Third, I would say it should be lasting. You shouldn't remove it for the sake of a budgetary cut, which is ephemeral or momentary. If these three parts of the equation are present, you can be across the gen. And I was surprised when I was talking, my colleague and I were talking to one of the CEOs, uh, unlikely company, which is I would say the laggard of the customer, Right, it was a manufacturing firm, right, uh, located deep inside the west of India. Right, uh, we would have never associated that company with actually doing so much of search. Uh, so when we spoke to the CEO, the CEO has done all the work, searched, uh, did a Google search, went to the platforms, compared us with everyone else, right, and then took a call, right, and uh, in influenced the other decision makers to actually make similar search. And so that they reduce the dissonance part of the equation. So that is key for us, right? So the equation is key, which is a message plus the media plus how lasting it is so that we can have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So that's how you ensure the buyer attention is there throughout the journey. Thanks both to you, Rob and Sam. Thank you. Yeah, um, really, uh, you know, Ram has hit a lot of the right notes there and I'm very, uh, you know, I agree with him on, a lot of the supply side dynamics. Um, I think, you know, a lot of this speaks to, you know, a concept we're probably all familiar with, which is around right message, right customer at the right time. Um, I think 
for me, what's more important is how we're adding real value to the end customer uh, in a way that is really meaningful. And, you know, as Anita, you touched on, uh, you know, increasingly complex customer journeys. Uh, I think we live and breathe every day. Um, I, I'd probably give some more color on some of the examples that are out there that speak to this, um, and, you know, covering both B2B, but also B2C. Um, first example that comes to mind is, is Airbnb again. Um, the travel industry is going through an incredibly tough time at the moment. Um, but, you know, their, their strategy was one where they've been able to pivot, right? Uh, they're focused on virtual experiences. Uh, no one can travel. Everyone's in, in lockdown. Um, you know, super, super interesting, uh, super, super, um, you know, interesting use case of how to stay relevant um, and how to, you know, react quickly. Um, at the, other, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, I think sometimes we, we can be guilty of overcomplicating the customer journey and trying to be too clever. Um, on my, you know, personally, I, I uh, when I uh, look at my uh, Gmail every morning, I see uh, a ton of things around uh, trying to sell me gardening equipment. Um, I don't own a garden. Uh, I don't have a garden. So, uh, you know, I think uh, it's about striking the balance um, to be relevant uh, to the end to the end consumer. Uh, and I think finally, uh, it's it's about being where your customers are. Um, we all know about the, the meteoric rise of, of mobile and, and mobile commerce, um, you know, um, of all the platforms, uh, LinkedIn being one of them. Um, but, you know, this, this really, for me, comes down to, you know, the role that content plays. And, you know, really, you know, we're seeing this shift to short, snackable, uh, consumable content. Thanks, Rob. Love that. Sam, it looks like you have a little analogy. Um, yes, up, yes. Okay, to share. Yeah. I completely agree with what uh, Rama and Rob mentioned. I just want to add the, the SaaS examples. Uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, focus on brand. I think brand needs to be prioritized in this day and age because it would really help you to stand out. And, and, and to stay relevant, you need to be, you know, engaging with our customers. So two examples I want to share. Uh, in terms of brand um, or, or, or uh, engagement, I, I should say, client engagement, so about um, two years ago, towards the end of 2019, uh, we had an ABM program where we you know, invited our top prospects and customers to go to an event in Singapore to have, a, you know, listen to a speech by Barack Obama and then have a meet and greet and a photo taken with him. So, you know, that's, that's a very, you know, amazing example of what a, 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 a business engagement event could do to really entice a customer to fly from wherever they're located in APAC to, to come to this event and remember this event for the rest of their lives. Because, uh, I mean, again, it's risky too. I mean, Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, they're a political figures, so, uh, you know, whether you like them or not, that's your personal opinion. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's the type of event uh, that we have in terms of uh, putting our brand out there to be associated with these figures. Um, another example would be to uh, increase engagement you know, we're selling software. So one way to entice people to try our software is not to push the product itself, but to make the experience of trying out the product more fun. So uh, we had this trial where the, we bundled a free trial of the software with dating analytics data you know, from a university research. So even if you're a data geek, what you're really doing is taking the set of data to analyze dating behavior by demographics, by race, by age, by gender. You know, something really cool that uh, I think it would be really interesting to find out, uh, you know, as a data geek. So, so those are two examples. I mean, I, I absolutely love this very resounding, uh, you know, anchor around, let's play the long game. Let's not get swayed. I think Rama, to your point, I think we've all kind of, we've all known that. I mean, that's, you know, that's marketing 101, 60%, 40% brand versus everything else. Uh, but it's particularly hard, I think, given the current context to kind of harken back to, you know, let's do this as an investment. Let's look at where is the customer today. Let's strike the right note with the right message. And I think all of that is increasingly harder uh, given the business and human humanitarian journey we've been over uh, the last 12 months. But it's really heartening to hear that, you know, all three of you very resoundingly kind of go back and say, yes, brand is important. Uh, you know, let's not lose sight of, uh, of that and get even sharper around you know, whether it's shorter, snackable messaging or it's about going back to emotion, which is uh, 
you know, again, an interesting piece of work that we did recently, which really talks about the role of emotion in building memorability, in building a lasting impression. Uh, we just about have time for, I think, one question, and we've got this absolutely killer one from the audience, uh, which is how can CMOs be ahead than the rest of the marketing and advertising teams, especially when it comes to longer term implications of digital solutions? So with all of us moving digital, when it comes to selling, when it comes to advertising, what are some of the longer term implications and how can CMOs stay ahead of that? Okay, uh, maybe I'll take that. Sure. Uh, I think this is a question from Pawan. Uh, Pawan, actually, uh, the proof is in the data. It's in the question of sales effectiveness. So how we actually show is that, in fact, we don't need to convert anyone, right? People have bought in. Uh, it is like uh, what I would call, we call sales effectiveness in terms of conversion factors. Like if you see the funnel, how they look at the funnel from the, which since we're talking B2B, clearly it's from lead to closure. So you have conversion percentages at various levels, whether you, how we classically call it as marketing qualified leads, MQLs to closure. So you have MQLs, SQLs, opportunities and customers. So opportunity to customer is a ratio no one can dispute. That's a truth that no everyone in the system is aligned to right if marketing is talking mql then it is not aligned to business if marketing is talking opportunity to customer conversion then we are all aligned to business right so that's where it stands when we are all looking at the same numbers right no one uh, the implications are quite clear because what we are talking is sales effectiveness what we are talking is marketing effectiveness what we are talking is conversion effectiveness that's how we understand it now we are not bring we are not bringing advertising because that's the hazy area that marketing needs to stand the ground and insist that it should be there. I have worked with one of my CEOs very early in my career. He used to ask me, what are you doing with advertising? Why are you using my money and flying kites in the company? But it did stand the ground because there was no option because at one day you need to be, you're responsible for bringing in leads and sales activation. But other side, you also need to ensure that your brand is visible, salient, is, is present before your audience. So these two is a conflict, is a paradox that we need to manage. But we can buy time. Always, we can always show our effectiveness in sales conversion because that's what feeds the brand. Without that, you can't invest in that. I hope I answer your question, Paul. Thank you. Maybe just to just to add to to um, what, Ram, what Ram is sharing, I probably I probably I'm gonna probably say three things. Is one the stakeholder stakeholder management and and kind of bringing everyone on the journey is absolutely crucial. Um, I think, you know, in terms of to, to your question of how do you stay ahead of the game, uh, it's about surrounding yourself with great people, um, you know, who are, who are on that journey with you. Uh, and I think the third thing that I'd say is, you know, a lot of the time it's actually about the long game, right? So it can be easy to get lost in the, the, the latest shiny thing or the, what I, you know, sometimes called the moonshot, but I think consistency uh, and, and the long game is key. Uh, Sam, your thoughts? I agree with you, Rob. I think, um, well, you know, surrounding yourself with uh, great people is key. I think surrounding yourself with great vendors is just as important because, you know, sometimes we live in our own company bubble and uh, you're not hearing the, uh, you know, the, the market outside. So usually vendors tend to do a good job of, you know, getting that market feedback to your company. But, you know, if you have a sizable budget then market research is critical. You know, um, social media in terms of social listening, that's critical to getting that feedback as to, you know, what people are saying about your company, your brand, or even industry trends out there. Thank you, Sam. I think we've covered the full gamut of, uh, you know, marketing principles. I've got a whole page full of notes, but I love how we talked about, you know, playing the long game, making sure you have the right, you know, partners on this journey, making sure you have the right strategy in place, but also the right team to execute to that strategy. Uh, we talked about, you know, understanding your stakeholders, understanding your customers before you actually go in to implement that strategy. Uh, we talked about the importance of messaging. Uh, we And we also talked about how data and insights will increasingly underpin um, our foundations and help us understand what outcomes we're all working towards and then make sure we have the right metrics. So we're measuring the right, right outcomes with the right metrics. I love this conversation. Uh, we probably have an opportunity for one final piece of advice uh, from, from each of you for our audience today. 
uh, I will say be brave. Be brave, love that. Yes, uh, well, my, my, my advice would be plan as if you'll live forever and live as if you'll die today. Sorry to end on a somber, a somber note, but um, yeah, <laughs> life is short. And deeply philosophical. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, in the midst of, we, since we operate with a lot of digital tools, uh, uh, we'll get fascinated with numbers, we'll get fascinated with technologies, but uh, it's more psychology than technology. Ooh, psycho more psychology than technology. I mean, that's Absolutely. that's a killer note to end today's uh, conversation on, guys. Um, love the conversation. Um, absolutely incredible uh, way to spend an afternoon with all of you. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. And Jumhi, uh, final, final wrap up from you then. Thank you so much, Anita, and thank you so much uh, for Sam, uh, Rob, and Rama. This was so interesting and we covered so much and I think we could have just gone on and on. Uh, thank you for your wisdom again. We will be collating all of these tips and learnings to share with all our participants. Um, and also if you've enjoyed today's session or if you have any specific feedback to give to us, please uh, use the poll which you will see on your screen now.